Good morning and welcome to our latest webinar on how to prevent neck pain. Um, welcome all of you, I hope you're managing to keep cool. Um, my name is Catherine Metters and I'm going to be hosting the webinar today and putting questions to our speaker um, after the event. A few housekeeping messages, um, we will be recording this today, so if you have any technical problems, don't worry, you can always come back onto our website and view it. We will also be sending you a link afterwards so you'll have a copy of it that you can share with your colleagues too. I would encourage you to participate and put your questions in the Q&A and I will put as many of them as I can to Becky afterwards. There's a little survey on the screen here as well now. Please feel free to, to join in and we'll just see how many of you have had back, uh, sorry, neck pain um, over the last two years. So that would be an interesting survey, I think. So really, without more ado, I want to introduce you to Becky. Um, Becky is a chartered physiotherapist and she's registered with the Health and Care Professions Council. She has over 19 years experience as a physiotherapist and she graduated from the University of Hertfordshire and then also was granted a scholarship to complete a postgraduate certificate from the University of Bradford in 2011. Becky's a clinical case manager at IPRS, who is an award-winning provider of corporate health and wellbeing solutions to employers, insurers and government organisations. And what does she do when she's there? Well, she's a specialist physiotherapist treating complex multi um, MSK, so musculoskeletal issues, and women's health patients. In, so I think she's very, very well placed today to talk to us about how to prevent neck pain. So I hope you enjoy the session. So Becky, um, over to you. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to start off by telling you um, a little bit about IPRS and who we are. Um, so IPRS Health, we've been in the industry over 27 years and we deal with musculoskeletal and mental health patients. We've got our own physiotherapy clinics um, and an extensive UK network and all sectors are provided for, so both public and private. And I think it's important important to say at this point that over the last year, so from July um, last year right to the end of June this year, we have treated 2,726 exactly neck cases um, and of those, although 275 were um, work related, there were a lot of those that weren't, so, so there were 1,061 that were not work related. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today is, is work and home life I suppose as well um, and it's important to say at this point that there are of these number of these 2,726 there were 1,360 people who said that their neck pain was aggravated by work um, so we're going to go through some um, information that will probably help you with that today so if we could have the next slide please I'm going to start off here by just explaining a little bit about the spine we all know what it is um, the human Human spine it's an incredibly robust um, it's made up of 24 small bones so what we call vertebra and they sit one on top of each other and they're held together by strong ligaments and muscles and they form a long mobile column um, and between each bone we've got a disc made from predominantly cartilage um, and that acts as a spacer between the vertebra and a shock absorber as well and then the spine it is three main areas. Um, we've got the cerv cervical spine, uh, which is the neck, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, then you've got your mid back, the thoracic spine and then lumbar spine as well. And now the uppermost section of the neck, which we're talking about today, it, um, it consists of the top seven vertebra. Um, so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So next slide, please. So why neck pain may develop and why there's no such thing as bad posture. So we all say, oh, there's bad posture, but it's, it's not necessary that. It's more that actually people say, is there a perfect posture? No, there's not, but you can prevent yourself from getting into consistent bad postures. So um, things that we 
tend to find cause neck pain are people who are sedentary, they're desk based and they've got poor habits at work and poor work setups. Um, so not taking breaks, you know, sitting on the couch or in bed with your laptop on your knee and um, those sorts of things. They're not your optimum posture um, and you are more likely to get pain if you are in those consistently. Um, so you've got injuries away from work, sports injuries, car accidents, things like that. Um, you, you know, if you've not sought assistance early on with a neck pain, if you've tried some self-management with exercises, which we'll come on to a little bit more, um, and you're not getting anywhere with that, instead of just thinking, oh, well, you know, it'll go away, I'll be fine. There are times when it is important to seek help uh, from a therapist or from, from your GP. Um, lifestyle is important in a, as an indicator as why neck pain might develop. Um, how many of us are guilty of looking at our phones all scrunched up looking like ET? Um, kids gaming, you know, adults gaming, maybe even. Um, so those sorts of things all have a link in with it, um, as do other biopsychosocial factors. Now I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. Um, and you can always come back to this slide if you choose to. But if we have the next slide, please, you can see that there's a whole host of different things that all come together um, that can cause you to have problems with your neck. So, you know, it could be manual handling, it could be poor work setup, uh, injury away from work, um, you could be overweight, you could be a smoker, you could be very stressed, um, you know, there could be financial things going on at home. And, it, you know, it, if we think about it, there are lots of different factors that all come together. And if we think about it like a jigsaw puzzle, everyone's puzzle is made up of different pieces of different sizes. So for somebody, their workload may be a big piece of that puzzle, um, but for others, it might be a small piece or it might not be a piece at all. Um, and so although we call it non-specific neck pain or the medical world does, um, it is actually very specific to you individually. Um, so, you know, if you've got pain in the neck, pain in the shoulders and there's no specific cause for it it could be non-specific pain okay next slide please I'm just going to quickly mention the different types of neck pain and what's most common so muscular pain it could be positional we probably all felt that where we've sat somewhere um, and we thought oh goodness me I do need to have a stretch and a move around that's probably muscular pain that you're feeling um, knots in your muscles could be when you've been asleep sometimes wake up in the morning you've been in a deep sleep and you wake up and you've got you know you're uncomfortable that's more likely to be a muscular pain and then of course whiplash um, can be muscular and joint um, arthritis is joint pain um, and some injuries as well whether that's a work injury a sports injury um, can be joint so next slide please the mechanical neck pain is normally localized to the neck. Um, you normally have stiffness, so reduced range of movement due to pain. It's normally the pain that's stopping you from, from moving rather than any stiffness or anything like that. It's usually, you know, it comes on gradually, so it's pain that starts without a trauma. Um, you may get it really quickly. It might come on over a few days or a few weeks and you may find that it radiates a little bit. So you might have pain in the tops of your shoulders um, and maybe in the top of the shoulder itself. And it's usually like a dull, achy pain, but you might find that on occasions it's sharp with certain movements. So often people will say when they're going to reverse their car and they look over their shoulder, that's when they feel it. Um, that's what we would call mechanical neck pain. And then more rarely, we've got the disc and nerve pain, which is pain that you tend to find goes down the arms. You have altered sensations like pins and needles, numbness, weakness. So holding a pen, going to pick a cup up, those sorts of things. Next slide, please. So I'm a physio. I can't not tell you that prevention is better than cure. Um, you know, regular movement is, is really, really important in preventing yourself from getting neck pain or, or lots of postural pain, um, to, be, to be fair. Um, we've all got 
smartphones, we've all got smart watches, or we've got access to a clock. So there's no reason not to set um, a repeat alarm to make yourself take a break. I know sometimes if you're working or if you're if you're doing something, you can get very into and focused on what you're doing and actually having an alarm just to break that, just to remind you that, you know, just a couple of stretches might do you good um, is a really good way to, to keep moving. Stay hydrated, having water at your desk. Um, I'm, I'm doing as I'm told, I'm doing the same, especially on a hot day like today. Um, creating a schedule with plans and goals. So if you've got, a, you know, if you can manage your own diary, whether you're at work or whether you're, you're at home, um, making sure that you're, you're taking breaks throughout the day or you've got times where you can get up and have a move around. And with conference calls and loudspeakers these days, there's no reason that we have to sit. We're not tied to the phone uh, on a wire like we used to be. Um, so there's no reason why we can't get up and have a little bit of a move around whilst we're on calls. Um, and then of course, there's, there's incorporating exercise and movement and stretches into your day anyway. Um, so even if you've had a busy day at work, you've obviously got that time once you've finished um, that you should be able to, to incorporate some exercise. And so what we say is sort of challenge yourself to move more during your working day. Um, break up your sitting with movement that challenges your muscles in different ways. Um, squat, use the stairs, uh, go for a walk challenge your colleagues even you know having support from our peers and office challenges can actually be quite good um and you could challenge the office culture could you suggest a walk um at lunch times or have a walking meeting for example and it's just to work towards being less sedentary um, and involving the workforce and being creative with that and um yeah so addressing being sedentary all the time could be a big thing for you so talking about being sedentary, next screen, please. We've got is sitting bad for you? We often get asked this and it's it's not that sitting per se is bad for you because it's not we're designed to sit. Um, but often it's it's not a choice and desk based workers sit down for large proportions of their day. Um, and th there's, there is a negative view of sitting and people do become overly worried about it. It's, it's not necessarily the sitting and the posture that's the issue, it's the prolonged sitting that is the problem. Um, so moving more and making sure that you are, you know, if you're aware that you're hunching over, you know, just make sure that you're sitting up a bit straighter and you're moving, you know, it doesn't need to be a lot. Um, I think I do it probably more because I'm, I'm aware of it, but, um, you know, just just a few little stretches and things can can help you. Um, so it's fine. Sitting is fine for you. Just move often. You know, if you were in bed lying down all day, that wouldn't be good for you either. If you were walking for 24 hours, that wouldn't be good for you. So it's just making sure that it's not something that you are doing all of the time. Um, so, no, it's not necessarily bad for you. Next screen, please. So there are obviously things that we can do to help us um, get in a position that is optimum for us. Now, we won't necessarily always stay in that position. We are humans. We do get tired. Um, and if you have a look at that little pink um, man sat up in the corner there, that's a workstation. That's not to scale and it's not necessarily the perfect posture for everybody. The things that we are looking for are your eye level at the top third of the screen. Um, if you've got more than one screen, use your screen that you have, uh, that you're using more regularly straight in front of you and then have the second screen slightly to the side that you don't use as often. You would ideally have relaxed shoulders and your arms would be supported. This chap here, he doesn't have um, his arms supported. So in that case, we took the elbows into each other and rest on the uh, on the desk if we're able to. Um, so make sure there's a small gap between the seat edge and the back of your knee. Use the back rest, have your hips slightly higher than your knees feet flat on the floor or on a foot rest and regularly use equipment, um, have it in easy reach. So the second image there, you can see, have the things that you're using more often close to you. So your, your mouse, your keyboard, your notepad, secondary working zone is your coffee. I have to admit my coffee is always in my green zone. Um, telephone, 
computer screen and then car keys, scissors, sellotape, anything like that a bit further away. Um, and then that way you're giving yourself the best chance of, uh, of not developing pain. Okay, next slide, please. If you're using a laptop, um, use a large screen to plug into if it's possible, if you've got one um, and use a separate keyboard and mouse. If you have a laptop stand, you can use that to raise it um, and have a more central position with it. Um, laptop, um, laptops and, and stands these days, they fold down so small that it's really good for hybrid working because it's so portable. Um, and again, you know, better positioning uh, will help you. So the better you can be, the more optimum it is to be um, the, your positioning. OK, next slide, please. So if you don't have an ergonomic chair, um, you know, you might be hot desking, you might be working from somewhere different. Um, I'm in my son's bedroom today because it's a hot day and it's the coolest room in the house. Um, you know, you, so you may sit somewhere different, but you can improvise. So look for cushions to sit on or against. Be creative with your household items. And if it is somewhere that you're going to be working from or sitting for more time, then it is worth seeking expert help and, and choosing the best chair for you. Um, and if your feet aren't touching the floor, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a footrest. You could try a box, a pile of folded towels. Um, a lot of us with kiddies, we've had the step stools that they use so that they can clean their teeth. Um, you know, those stools are perfect to go under the desk as well. So just just improvise. And if your chair doesn't have any harm, armrests, not harm rests, um, armrests, just tuck your elbows in and rest your um, your wrists or your forearms on the desk in front of you. OK, next slide, please. So neck first aid, what do you do if you do have neck pain? OK, so a lot of people worry that they're going to cause themselves more pain or more damage and actually not moving. It, it does cause it can it can make your pain worse. Um, movement is how our joints and our tissues stay healthy. And so gradually increasing your range of movement can be really helpful. Um, and just because it is initially painful doesn't mean that you're causing more damage or making anything worse. So the main things that you would need to do is take your pain medication um, to help calm the pain down and enable you to move. So speaking to your local pharmacist is ideal for this to make sure that you're taking the right medication for you. You can use heat or cold. It doesn't matter which. It's personal preference. Both work equally well. It is your choice in this weather. You're probably going to go more cold than heat, but either is fine trying to stay active without causing your pain getting worse. So neck pain is unlikely to stop you from going for walks or any other light activity. So make sure that you're still doing those. And then exercises and asking for help um, when you need it. And I'll explain to you a little more about when you will need that help. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through this in full depth with you. This is something that you can come back to. But the things that we would say you need to seek help for are if you've got any dizziness, uh, any double vision problems, speaking or swallowing, if you've got um, pins and needles down both of your arms, you can't walk properly, you've lost your coordination, you're feeling nauseous or you're vomiting, any tingling or numbness in your, your face, your tongue, your mouth. Um, and if you start dropping things or you have new severe headaches, that's what we would say requires a same day medical opinion. Um, and we would recommend that you call 111 or contact your GP for a same day appointment. So do come back to this slide uh, for future reference. And um, that's the really important bit. OK, so next slide, please. So the basics. What I've told you today is take time for yourself and keep moving. You need to exercise little and often and regularly and sensibly. So preferably not with your pooch or your kids on your back. Um, and then making sure that you've got the right equipment for the task that you're doing or the best that you have in that moment. Next slide, please. Now, um, you can go on to our website, which is myiprshealth.com. This is a free self-help website. You don't need a referral. 
there's so much information on there it's really good it's very interactive if you've got an ankle injury you can see on the screen there there's a there's a man there just click on the ankle uh, it will bring up sort of common ankle injuries and it will give you the exercises to do for them and the same with uh, the neck so if you go on there and you want to have a look for some simple exercises that you can be doing um you know day in day out if you want to at your desk then that this is the place to go and we've given you the password to get in there so like i say there's no referral needed it's posturite with a capital p um, and i believe this will be emailed to you afterwards today as well um, so do go on and use that free resource um, there's plenty of blogs and things on there as well if you've not got any pain and you just wanted to look after yourself or you're wanting to direct your um your learning a little bit more that's a fantastic place to have a look next slide please so yeah we're moving on to the questions if that's all right thank you that's amazing becky thank you so much um it comes to no surprise to you that we have loads of questions <laughs> so um bear with us yeah um, actually whilst you were talking i was i was i remember actually how i got into physio i i actually got into physio due to a neck problem when i was um i suppose early teens i was a keen horse rider and i had a horse show the next day and i woke up with my neck all a bit like this and trying oh. to ride a horse and our next door neighbour was a physio. So that's how it all started. Oh, well, mine's, years mine, ago. mine's quite similar. I was two and I remember <laughs> going with my mum. She had a whiplash and I was allowed to make the electric bed go up and down. There you go. Yeah. And I was like, that's it. That's the job for me. And of course, I am now nearly 40. I've been in this job a long time. And when I'm in clinic, I still don't have a bed that's electric. I use the foot pump. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say I'd spend my whole time putting the desk up and down. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's interesting. We've um, we've got a result from the poll. Seventy-seven percent of people said they had neck pain in the last two years. So um, I, it doesn't surprise me because I've certainly seen huge rise in in neck pain um, during during lockdown because I think people went home with their laptops. So um, absolutely. But I'm glad everyone's here and listening. So so that's great. Right, Becky. So can I can I start you off with this question? Yeah. What's the most effective workstation setup when working with multiple screens? Yeah, so I think I, I touched on this whilst we were going through, but I think if you've got one screen that you're using more than another, um, it makes sense to have that as your most central screen um, and then following, you know, the, the, the normal rules of making sure that it's, it's at the right height and you're at the right height. Um, but yeah, if it's if it's if it's one screen that you use more regularly, have that as your main screen in front of you and the other one next to it. I think if you're using them both equally, then try and have them sort of right next to each other um, so that you're not having to, to, to turn too much. They're both in your eye line in front of you. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think I'm going to tack on another que uh, another sort of statement and question from, from Val um, um, talking about actually position the screens if you've got different lenses in your glasses, because, of course, not all of us have, you know, um, perfect eyesight and sometimes we have graduated lenses. And so certainly I think you know you'd agree that sometimes you need to vary the height of your screen according to where you look in your, through your glasses don't yeah, you I think that's absolutely. really important yeah and I do that I, I'm wearing contact lenses today but you know if you're working if you're working hybrid as well and you're in different places you can find that the glare on the on your lenses if you're wearing glasses can make a difference so it's it's taking the time in that moment just to make sure that you are at the best you know you can you've got your screen brightness right you, you've angled your screen as best you can really yeah, I think it's all about you know, checking in with yourself. Have I got the best that I can do with what I've got at that time? Isn't Absolutely. it? You know where you're trying to achieve and, and to work at it. Excellent. So um, what strategies have you found most effective to get a workforce engaged when, when you know, to get them to look after their own posture? Because it, it is ours to look after, isn't it? It is indeed. And I think, you know, with this one, you're looking at um, you know, set up challenges within an, you know, if you're within an office space, um, even if you're working remotely, you can still have challenges running, movement challenges, um, you can have clear desk policies, um, you can um, have regular breaks that are factored in, you know, across a team, it doesn't really matter, or it can be put in people's individual diaries. Um, you could have somebody leading office stretches 
somebody different every day is doing some different stretches it doesn't really matter I mean one of the things that my colleague told me was that in an office they set up a, a Mexican wave so every 30 minutes they set off a Mexican wave around the office just as a bit of a laugh um, and so it, do, it doesn't have to be anything very formal it, it can you know it can be fun um, but also obviously internal DSE provisions are important as well. Um, so yes, we can take responsibility as individuals for ourselves and then organisations can do things to help us. I think I'd, what I take from that very much is it, it needs to be talked about as a team, to see how it works for you and how we can all support. Because we all get busy, don't we? And sometimes we, 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 we fall into bad habits because we're busy doing something else and it's useful for your colleague to, to sort of nudge you. But you have to have that conversation to begin with otherwise it could be difficult can't it so, yeah um, and I, yeah. I personally I find that time blocking is very useful um so the way that I work you know I, I have some control over my calendar for when I when I'm on patient calls and when I'm not and when I'm writing reports and things so I'm I'm quite lucky in that sense but I would encourage anybody you know even if you've not got a, a specific diary like an outlook diary just jot it down on a piece of paper or there are apps that you can use that you can you know help you with your work working day to complete a task and then you've got time then to to go away and do something movement wise um, I'm going to some of the Q&A that, that have come through um, recently so and um, we've got a question here I'm developing a small curve bump in my neck sadly I don't think you're the only one um, the person who's asked this question and I, I've noticed it feels hard for me to you know to, to walk more upright what can I do um, so I think, I, sadly, I think this lady's uh, not alone with, with, with her no. concerns. I think a lot of people have, have, have noticed this, especially with working from home um, and sometimes just with age, with stiffening as well. Um, and it is quite a specific question. So, you know, with this kind of thing, we would suggest that you go and see a professional like a physio um, so that they prescribe you some exercises that are ideal for you. But in the meantime, you could go on the website, you could have a look at, on my IPRS health um, and there are simple exercises that you can do for neck pain and you could do those for a couple of weeks and you could see if it makes a difference for you but um, usually with with the hump it's it tends to be a postural and stiffness kind of thing that that is going to take a little bit of time and effort to 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 get over well, worth worth looking into now because you know, to get it sorted isn't it yeah yeah um, is there a recommended number or type of pillows? Ah, there you go. I'd be interested in your response on that. <laughs> I think it's different for everybody. It depends on, you know, your height, your weight, your type of mattress that you've got, um, whatever's comfortable for you, really. I mean, personally, I quite like the pillows that have got a, the orthopedic pillows, that have a memory foam that have got a little bit of a, a roll in them. I find that comfortable for me. Um, and yet my husband, he absolutely hates it. He has to sleep flat on one pillow. So I think it's it's finding what works for you and, and you know, and thinking when you're lying down there, am, am I in a good position? I mean, if your chin's down on your chest or you're looking up, at, you know, and your neck's really far back, then probably you're not in the optimum position and you might want to play around with using more or less pillows um, but generally I think most people sleep with what's right for them because they can get to sleep in that position. I think again isn't it just taking time and probably with somebody else to actually think well I do sleep on my side or my back let's look at the posture we achieve yeah you know it's just taking those five minutes and saying oh actually that's pretty good that's fine but oh actually no maybe I'll try something different so it's just giving yourselves a bit yeah. of time just to check it isn't it. And even getting somebody to take a picture of you whilst yeah. you're lying there so that, you know, from, from at the back or from at the front so that you can see, oh, actually, I'm really not in alignment at all there. Maybe I ought to do something with that. Um, yeah. And then and then obviously, if you if you are struggling and you're, you're not sleeping well due to pain, then obviously physio is, is your next step. Yeah, there's been quite a lot of discussion about armrests on chairs um, and, you know, whether they should be, whether we should have them, whether we shouldn't. Um, I certainly have a view on that. But I mean, do, do, do you do you want to to sort of say anything about from, that? From my point of view, when people ask, I think a lot of it is, you know, the chair itself is the most important thing. The angle of your hips and your knees, that your feet are, are not swinging or or anything like that and that your workstation is set up properly. Um, I think the arms are more of a secondary thing really it, you know if you've not got a chair with them it's not the end of the world you could tuck your elbows into your sides you can you can rest your arms on your work surface but if you've got them 
fine use them if that's mm. comfortable for you yeah I've always I mean I don't see them so often but we used to have those big hoop arms and they used to stop people getting close to the workstation and I would yeah. say they are more of a hazard than something but if your armrests allow you to get close I think they can be useful because they do take some of the load yeah. but um but if you get close a lot of times people don't need them but it's yeah. it's important you keep close isn't it and Absolutely. the armrest can often be a problem relative to that so I yeah. think that may be where this discussion has sort of come from is that uh, there was a time when I think people thought armrests were bad because the only armrests we had were very big ones. Absolutely. So, um, you know, it, it's all about the posture. Um, there's also been quite a lot of discussion about standing desks or desks that allow people to vary um, their position. Um, thoughts on neck pain, neck posture and yeah, sit -stand desks? I think I think as long as you're following all the basic rules that we've gone through about your screen height and things with your eye level um, and, and the main thing to take away from it is is move often. You know, you don't want to be standing all day. You don't want to be sitting all day. So it's taking the time out just to make sure that you're moving regularly sort of every hour or so that you are changing position. So I think they're a great addition to any team, really. Yeah, I think it's just another tool that allows us to look after our, our health in many ways, aren't they? But they have to be used right, like yeah. any like any tool. If it's used poorly, it can be as much of a problem as, as not having it in, at all. So, um, yeah, no, I think Absolutely. that's great. Um, there's quite a lot of questions about the sort of exercises that people should do. Um, Becky, what's your what's your advice about I would just giving say generic, generic advice? Yeah, just general range of movement exercises. You know, if, if we're talking specifically about the neck, you've got six main movements. You've got looking either side. You've got looking up, looking down and side to side. They're the most mm. basic ones you can do. They're very easy. They're simple. You don't need any equipment. Uh, you can sit to stand from your chair. You can squat. Um, but if you want in something a little bit more specific, maybe you're a bit stiff in your upper back and, that, and that's, you know, that's what you're feeling. It's more of a stiffness. Then again, you know, have a look on the, the My IPRS Health website mm. and, uh, and there'll be further exercises that you could do there and and in fact the NHS website has got some really good exercises for posture as well yeah I think we must also forget the Chartered Society of Physio website yes because, um, absolutely you know, they, they have quite a few too don't they, they do I've um, got an interesting question here um saying that often people find that the combination of neck and shoulder pain due to people not being supported properly. And they were just asking about a physio's point of view about the interplay between neck and shoulders. And I just wondered if you wanted to touch on that. Yeah, so I think I think we touched on it a little bit um, when we were going through the types of neck pain, but it's not unusual for, for the neck to refer into the, the tops of the shoulders um, and sometimes down the arms as well. Um, so that's that's not an uncommon thing. That's just the way that our bodies work, that you feel the pain somewhere else from maybe where the initial problem is. Um, I think the other thing is if you are not in a good position all of the time maybe you are somebody who tends to hunch like this or you're not sitting in a great position and then you're moving and lifting things you are going to be putting excess strain through the shoulder joint not in its optimum position um so by putting yourself in the optimum position you're more you're less likely to get the shoulder pain um so yeah so there is a play between the two a just from the neck and b from overuse of the shoulder if you're not in a, an optimal position Mm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading the chat and there's been uh, a little flurry of chat about um, youngsters and I think I can say that due to my age, youngsters, phones and tech neck. Yeah, I think absolutely. we mustn't forget the younger generation in this. Um, so yeah, over over to you, Becky. Any thoughts well, on that? I've got how, a ten-year-old son. <laughs> ten-year-old son who managed to break his foot playing tennis last week. So uh, gaming is very high on his list of priorities at the minute. Seeing as he can't get out in the paddling pool. So yeah, and I've said the same to him. 
try and be in a good position and move regularly. I mean, and he has taken it, actually. You know, I'll find him. He'll be lying on his tummy and then another time he'll be lying a different way. Don't forget you've got stands for, for mobile phones and for tablets now as well. Um, there's loads of different ways and taking regular breaks and making mm. sure that you're moving. I, I say to him, you know, even if you just hop to the toilet on your crutches and back, you've moved. You know, you just don't want to be at it all the time and just be in as best a position that you can be. Um, and he's actually set his own boundaries. He said to me, Mum, I shouldn't have more than half an hour tech at a time because it gives me a bit of a headache. And I'm like, well, why could it give you a headache? And he said, because I'm not sitting properly. So, you know, even with the, the younger ones, instead of saying to them, oh, you know, you're having too much tech or, you know, that's it, you're banned. Because <laughs> I've tried that and it doesn't work. Um, I think the, the thing is to explain to them why we're saying these things, why it's not good for you to be in those positions, educate mm. them and let them make those decisions and actually sometimes letting them make the mistakes as well. Mm. No, I think so. I think we've got a lot of work to do there. If we want these people to look after us when we're older, I think we need to to, in, <laughs> to invest in them, really, don't we? Sort of yeah. to go through. I've got a, 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 a naughty question here for you, for you Becky. Oh. Um, it's one that, no, I mean, I'll try and help you. Um, we've got lots of questions about chiropractors and osteopaths and, and, and what is better. Um, and do you, do, you, do you have a viewpoint you wish to share or do you want me to fill in on something on that one? <laughs> I think, you know, we're all working towards the same goal at the end of the day in that we want you to be pain free and be able to live your life as best as you can. I think as physiotherapists, we do take quite a holistic look at a patient in that we're trying to give them the tools to be able to manage things for themselves so although yes we can do hands-on treatment we also will educate you and give you the right exercises and management strategies that you can take away so that you're not then reliant on us yeah I mean my viewpoint is to say very much like you is I mean um, we're all different in a skill set but we're all ultimately aiming at the same place and I, I over the years I've known some excellent physios some excellent chiropractors some excellent osteopaths and known people that haven't been so good I mean so if you you know go on I've always said you know personal recommendation make sure people are qualified um, and you know does that suit you and if it suits you then that's probably the best thing for you I think um, everyone's aligning much more closely these days I think um, but qualification and make sure that the insurance is right um Absolutely. you know i think is so so important yeah um so there's also i mean there, there is this very specific question i think we said uh, somebody's asking about whether repeated steroid injections are any good and i think we would say you probably need to um contact a, a medical professional and, and have a good discussion about that yeah. Um, it's for I, a very specific cause yeah. yeah for a specific cause so that would be yeah that's not sort of generic advice I don't think that we could give in this situation yeah I think so um one that probably I'll take if you don't mind unless you want to join um, no? Becky is about is this our number our keyboards without number pads better at preventing neck and shoulder pain um, and sort of with my ergonomics I quite like to pop on and just say if you look at the size of a standard keyboard it's actually often as wide as a human and if you're going to have your mouse at the end of it it can encourage the arm to come out so depending on your size and what you do if you are using your mouse a lot and you're quite petite you may find actually having a smaller keyboard is useful but it really depends on what you do and your sizing but I have to say I use a lot of small keyboards because I find quite often that it's helpful yeah. um, but one size doesn't fit all on that thing um right so oh yes we've had this a few times too I was a, a really good physio on this one we talk about clicking noises that come from the neck and the shoulders whilst doing exercises I think people would like to know whether they should be concerned about it yeah I think I think it's it's normal for necks to sort of to, to click and to to make noises um it's it's not necessarily a problem unless you're having pain with it um and I think that unless you're forcing your neck past a point that it's sort of comfortable to go, um, then you won't have too much, too much difficulty and that you're not forcing the cracks, basically. So mm. general movements, like we said, in all, all of those six directions, side to side, 
looking up and down and your rotation, um, you, you should be absolutely fine. And if you are concerned about the cracking, then sometimes what you can do, uh, we've, we've found in studies that resistance training is very, very good um, for necks that, that are a little bit clicky and poppy. Um, so you can do that really simply with, with those movements that we've just discussed. Just put your, put your hand there. Um, you can resist yourself from tipping your head side to side just gently or stopping yourself from rotating gently hand on the forehead to stop yourself moving forwards and just holding it for a few seconds that will sort of aid your strength with time mm. no that, that great thank you um there have been a few questions about um the importance of a, a dsc assessment um I, I don't know whether you want to comment on that or whether you'd like like me to talk about that i think i think it's it's if you need one um, and you're working uh, at an office where you're there day in, day out, um, I think that it's personally, if it's provided by your, your employer, then it's a good idea to accept it. Um, but I'll, I'll let you lead on that one, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there, I mean, there is a legal requirement to do DSE assessments um, for all uh, people who, who are users. Um, but I would say, actually, a DSE assessment, actually, we should all do a sort of a, a dynamic one every day when we sit down at our workstations. You know, it's not that difficult to make sure that we're set up in the right position, we can achieve a good position. And that's as much of an assessment, really, as actually the more formal one. So, yes, you need to make sure you have your formal ones to complete, um, comply with the regulations. But I would also encourage everybody each time they sit to work for, you know, more than 15 minutes, you know, obviously, if it's in the sunshine, and you're doing a Zoom call, you know, laptops fine, but anything more than that to do your own little in your head, get my DSC set up right. So um, I, I'd like to encourage people to do that. Um, right. Um, just trying to see which I've tried to sort of group some together here. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about exercises. Um, oh, can you ever get pain? elsewhere that comes from the neck without neck pain there you go that's a question that came through yeah you can yeah you can get referred pain normally there is sort of an element of, of, of either history of a neck injury or or something like that or previous neck pain um but yes the neck does refer like we said before it can refer to the tops of the shoulders and in some cases down the arms sometimes you can get tingling or numbness um and you can get weakness as well so yeah absolutely it can so this is a lovely one that I like, um, and I don't think we can necessarily answer it here, but I think it, it, it is. You know, um, somebody who is teaching dental students and they're saying, you know, treating patients on a dental chair is notorious to cause chronic neck and, and back pain. Um, you know, does this um, actually cause a, a change in posture? Um, in fact, well, it, it does change it as well. Is it reversible? And um, are there physical exercises to help with posture correction? So I think there's lots into that one, but I think it's there quite is, an interesting think, one. Yeah, I think as long as breaks are taken within the working day um, and, and simple exercises and stretches like we've already discussed are done um, and the dentists themselves are looking after themselves outside of work and doing their exercises and, and staying as healthy as they can be, there shouldn't be a long term issue really. Yeah. Um, you know, some people may be more predisposed than others. Um, and, and I think as long as the, the dentists personally are taking some element of responsibility um, and their organisation is, and again, that they're, they're, they're in the best posture with what they've got at that moment in time. Um, and like you say, dynamically checking that day to day and, you know, patient to patient because the, the beds can move, can't they? We've all been to the dentist, you know, um, it's like the physio couches, they can be moved. And I think as long as you are being dynamic with that and you are aware of what position the patient is in, then you're doing the best that you can. Mm. I think for me, it's very representative of my ergonomic hat on is the fact that we all need to look at every activity that we do and we say, you know, what are the risks? And if there are postural risks, how are we going to mitigate them? Can we change the position? Or the one thing we've always got is movement, isn't it? So yeah. if you can't change the position, you need to move more. And I think doctors and um, chiropodists and people often have to get in very difficult positions. But we need to design work so there's plenty of movement involved. You know, humans are great at being adaptable, but we, we need to put limits on it sometimes. Though. So, Absolutely. Um, 
Right, do you know what? I think we're going, we've pretty much run out of time, I think, here. Um, we'll, we'll try and um, see if there's any important ones we haven't managed to answer, and we'll, 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 we'll bring that back. Um, so I want to thank you, Becky. Um, brilliant. Um, and I hope that's really helped people to sort of get some of the basics right. Um, what we're going to be doing um, after this, um, we're going to, you're going to all receive a follow-up email um, and you'll get a, a, not only um, the information, a recording and that type of thing, but it will also give you a 5% discount on, on laptop stands. So hopefully if you, if you haven't got your workstation set up at home, maybe you know, you're thinking maybe this is something is, I hope that would help you. We've also, because uh, Becky works for IPRS, been allowed to offer you free access to the, the portal the IPRS portal, and there's some fantastic resources on there. So I'd strongly encourage you to, to go in and have a look at that. Um, you'll need the um, the password, which was in the which is in the presentation, which is Posturite. So um, please go and go and have a look at that, and feel free to share this recording um, with anybody who think be helpful. And if you have any questions, you, you know where to find us. So I think the only thing today is say. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much for your time and, and your you. energy. And, and I know people will be grateful for that. And um, from my own point of view, I, know I would like to see you all next next month where we're actually going to be talking about DSE assessments. Our next webinar is going to be specifically on that on the 27th of September. So we haven't got a sign up page yet, but you're all on our on our database. So we'll, we'll send you a, a link and I look forward to seeing you then. So um, thank you, Becky. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Enjoy the sunshine, and um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Okay, bye. Then. Bye bye now.